Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Tremaine Waller, and I work for the College of Engineering. We want to say thank you so much for coming out to master your future or uh, joining the Zoom session. Uh, we're going to wait about two minutes to give people time to log in, and we'll get started with the presentation more than a credential. We're going to get started here shortly, waiting just a couple minutes uh, to give people time to log in. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're excited that you're with us today for Master Your Future. We have with us Dr. Walter Lee. He is an associate professor in the College of Engineering and Engineering Education, and he will be speaking to us about more than a credential. We'll take about 25 minutes for his presentation, and afterwards, uh, we'll entertain those questions that you all may have. And he's also identified, if you do have questions along the way, please do not hesitate to put those in the chat box. He will be monitoring those questions. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Lee, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you for the introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate you taking some time out of your busy day to join me for a chat today. This will be fairly informal. I do have slides, but I am open to discussing whatever y'all want to hear more about. I generally approach presentations by giving you enough information to motivate some questions, but not necessarily so much that the conversation won't go where you want to go. So if you do have questions along the way and you type something in the chat, I do have that up. So like I can say more about something if I bring up something that y'all would like to hear more about or if something's unclear, I would prefer that y'all kind of let me know that as we go along. So when I was invited to give this talk, I came up with the title pretty quickly before I knew exactly what I would talk about. And this was like the first thing that came to mind. So really thinking about the fact that a lot of times I think we oversimplify what it means to get some of these credentials. So today I'm gonna kind of share some of the things that I've personally came to understand through my experience of getting a PhD and being a faculty member and hoping that some of this is helpful as you think about some decisions you're making in the future and what the implications of those decisions might be that aren't necessarily always obvious. So to start, I will disclose some information about my credentials. So I spent my entire childhood in the exact same city so from a contextual standpoint, I'm from Goose Creek, which is in South Carolina, which is right outside, of, right outside of Charleston. I think I grew up pretty standard, at least it felt like it was standard. I don't know if it would be considered lower middle class or middle class, but I think I'm 
pretty from a pretty standard background. Parents are not engineers. Parents are not academics. I kind of didn't take academics too seriously until probably when I got around high school, and like that's kind of where I picked up like my first credential, high school diploma. I chose engineering similar to a lot of people. I was good in math and science. People pointed it out. Didn't really have like very strong motivations for it. So at the beginning of this journey, it wasn't really like I wasn't really working to go somewhere specifically as much as kind of just following where other people were kind of pointing me. After I graduated from high school, I went to Clemson University where I got a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering and a minor in sociology. Again, I chose industrial engineering largely because I was interested in people, hence the minor in sociology, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. And I think at the time the engineering I was sold or at least advertised was not what I was gonna be able to do when I finished. And I realized very quickly that I had no interest in working in manufacturing, but I really enjoyed sociology courses. So I ended up with a minor because I would just take a sociology class every semester to like offset the technical courses. And ultimately that kind of compiled to a minor. And then the intersection of these two is actually what drove me to graduate school, which when I came to Virginia Tech in 2010, I had no intention of being here that long. I thought I would come here from, for my graduate degree and then leave. But as you can see, I'm still here. So I get got my industrial and systems engineering degree with a concentration in human factors from the department here. And then I also got my engineering education PhD, which really kind of was like the perfect blend of both of the worlds. In a very atypical situation, the opportunity popped up to stay here as a faculty member. And since then, I have picked up a lot of the different experiences that have different meanings to different people, but I did start as an assistant professor, I was recently tenured, so I'm now an associate professor. I was also an assistant director for research with SEED. Once I got promoted, I was able to just change that title to director for research. I've done a lot of different things. So I've been an associate editor for a journal. I've led a special issue for a journal. I teach a lot of different courses. I'm working on a special project for the Dean right now, focused on mentoring. I've been able to kind of collect a lot of different experiences as I've gotten more intentional. And that kind of provides the context of which I'm viewing this so that you have an idea of what I have been doing from where these insights came from. If you aren't familiar with SEED, SEED is the Center for the Enhancement of Engineering and Diversity. So in addition to being a faculty member, I also work closely with SEED, primarily thinking about assessment and evaluation and other research efforts. And I did a lot of work with them as a graduate student, leading things like mentoring programs, residential communities, working with um, Black students and mentoring, things of that nature. So I think if I had to boil down like what credentials I've picked up that people generally would assume have qualified me for different things, these are like the things that come to mind the most. Like I think these are like the most salient credentials I picked up. And I do think that they have had big implications on like what my life looks like beyond kind of just the work I do. But as I mentioned, I think a part of me was on autopilot when I was kind of just like collecting these credentials. So like I picked up the master's, I picked up the doctorate, I got the bachelor's, I got a team track job and I kind of just like followed this very linear path that I think was kind of laid out for me. And I don't think until fairly recently I've started to really think about how I want my life to look like and like what control looks like and what some of these decisions that I made when I was probably more on autopilot, like what they, how they have shaped my life today. And like, that's kind of the space I'm in right now. And I was like, okay, this is a, this might be useful. This might be helpful to someone. And that's kind of what I've chosen to share today. As I've been thinking about this, there's a very kind of common debate in social sciences as it relates to the relationship between structure and agency. And I think this boils down how I'm thinking about it. I think one of the things that we have constantly think about is when are we actually making decisions on our own versus when are we kind of being pushed towards certain decisions based on like the structure and culture around us. And I thought this picture was, I think a lot of people feel like this, like you're just being controlled by a complex system and being pushed forward. And I think while that is true in some ways, 
I do think we have some agencies, but I don't think a lot of times we kind of focus in on that. So today I'm specifically going to be focusing on that element of where do you have choice, but also kind of highlighting some instances where if you make a certain decision, the structure that comes with that decision might actually take away certain choices that you didn't realize were being taken away. Because I have found myself in interesting situations and I'm like, okay, there are some parameters now because of a choice I made that I don't necessarily know I thought about. And that's gonna be today's objective. So I'm really just hoping that I can share some of my experiences in a way that you find useful as you're trying to make decisions about what you wanna do moving forward. And I'm gonna do this by talking about the lowlights and highlights of one, the choice I made regarding the degree, but also the choice I made about the career path that I'm on. In some ways they're hard to separate, but as I was thinking about what key points I would want to make, this is kind of like the way I've gone through. So there are nine of them. As I bring these up, if you have questions, I will pause to see if someone has a specific question because there's not, there's not going to be a lot of content on these slides. So we can kind of, I will say more as I think it's necessary or as people have follow-up questions. So the first one is like earning a PhD had an opportunity cost. I think a lot of times we focus on like the benefits of it, but like in hindsight, the fact that I stayed in school this long did mean that there were other things I could not do. So when I finally finished, I had friends who I felt like had already started their personal lives, their family lives, had been making money for five or six years, were not, were living in places that were not Blacksburg, Virginia. And I think I realized very quickly that it was one of those things where it's like, it's not that I, it's not necessarily like, is this the best choice? Like, or is this a good choice? I think sometimes we forget about the fact that like there are other choices that could have been made. And I think ultimately, I think I made the right choice, but I think at the time, I don't know if I gave a whole lot of thought about like what else I might've been doing if I did not get the PhD. I think in a lot of ways I got the PhD because I didn't know what else I was gonna be doing. And again, like, I think it's real easy to kind of get an autopilot of being like, well, I can just go to more school. And then after school, I can just go to this job and I think, I would basically encourage you to not just follow a path just because of the path there and to really spend some time thinking about where you would wanna go if you didn't know what most people did. And I think a lot of times we just assume if most people that came this path do this next, that's kind of what my options are. And I think it took me a little later in life before I started realizing like I have a lot more choice than I might've realized earlier. Which brings me to the second point. It was also a very all-encompassing experience. Like I think earning a PhD drastically changed like every other part of my life because during that process, it basically kind of captured everything I was doing. I think it changed the way I think, changed the way I viewed other professions, changed the way I viewed education, changed the way I view work. Like it just became this thing that kind of was basically all embracing. Like, and I, don't think we talk about that a lot, but I do think that like the choice to spend this much time focusing on something, if you let the process do what it's going to do, like it's going to fundamentally make you a different person. And luckily I was happy with the person I became on the other end, but I don't know if I necessarily understood what I was getting myself into when I signed up for it. And one of the bigger highlights, it does come with a lot of transferable skills. And this was just an image I, found on Google that I thought did a good job of capturing it. And I think I've started to learn this more as I've advised PhD students, particularly because I'm in a field that was fairly new when I chose it. So engineering education, if you're not familiar, is not a very old field. And at the time when I started it, like one of the things they constantly told us was, there will be job opportunities, but we don't necessarily know what they are. So I think sometimes we underestimate the amount of skills you develop as a PhD student. And I think as I, the pandemic specifically has forced me to take a step back. And I think I've spent a lot of time talking to entrepreneurs and other people who have like used their skills in more creative ways and has helped me realize that like, we can do a lot of stuff. We just aren't necessarily taught to see those skills as, as transferable as some people in other spaces. And I would strongly encourage you to really think about like, where are the things I'm learning useful? even if they don't call it the exact same thing. Because again, I think that will help you realize that there's a whole lot more you can do 
than just go into the academy or even just take a traditional job in industry. Like I really think that the options are pretty limitless if you're willing to take some risk. And if you're willing to kind of think a little bit more creative and not think about only trying to take up spaces that you see other people already in. So that is where I'm at right now. And I think those are kind of like my biggest takeaways from earning the PhD specifically, which feels a little far away now since it was a little while ago. But there are also some things that, because I chose to work in the academy, that I think have drastically had some implications on different things. So one, which I think is a very important point to realize, if you care where you live, like if you, if that is a very high priority on your list, choosing to be a faculty member drastically limits that. So that was something I had to be comfortable with. At the time when I was on the job market, if I wanted to be a faculty member, there was like three or four places I could live if I wanted to be in an engineering education department, which means I just couldn't, like I just took away choices from me. And I think at some point I had to decide really like, I feel like when I was making a choice, I had to decide if I was gonna prioritize my career at the moment or my personal life at the moment, because if I could live anywhere, like I honestly wouldn't be living in the college towns where a lot of engineering education programs are. And I think that was just something that I had to grapple with. Like choosing a certain path does take away some of your choices. Like I would kind of equate it to like being a professional athlete. You end up where you are, like you can only go where the jobs are. And I think that people who really, really care where they live and don't ever want their career to kind of be driving that decision, just need to know that if they want to be a tenure track faculty member, specific, or a faculty member specifically, that these are not jobs that exist everywhere. And sometimes you have to be willing to let the work decide where you're living. And I think sometimes that's a decision people want to live with and sometimes it's a decision they don't want to. But I do think that you just need to be very mindful of that fact. And, and I think you just have to live with the consequences sometimes if that's the path you want to go. Um, it also provides me with a lot of intellectual flexibility. So my favorite part of the job is that I never get bored. I get to decide which questions I ask. I get to decide how I answer them. And I'm interested in human differences. So my work specifically focuses on diversity and inclusion. And I have felt like I can explore that in a variety of ways. I get to teach. I get to do research. I get to work with undergrads. I get to work with grad students. I have just felt like I know that if I take some other jobs, I wouldn't have the same amount of flexibility. And I think that's one of the cons where like, while I can't choose where I live all the time, I can choose what I think about. And I think that was a trade-off that I was willing to make that I don't think everybody is. And I do think that it is important to know yourself. Like, will you be happy if your job does not necessarily provide you with some of these flexibilities, but you're living in a life and you're living near your family in certain ways? Or if you could choose where you live, would you be happy in a job where people are specifically telling you what to think about and specifically telling you what to do? Or do you need both? And if you need both, you might have to be creative. But it is something that I have really come to appreciate about being a faculty member is, and I don't take it for granted that I have a lot of space to think. And I think it's allowed me to learn a lot about myself, a lot about other people. Like I can, I basically get paid to read, write and talk to people. And I don't like, that's just not a typical job. So that is one of the things I would consider highlight, probably my favorite part about being a faculty member. And if I had to do it all again, I don't know if I would, I don't know if I would give this piece up because I think that like that intellectual flexibility is probably the thing I, like the thing that probably brings me like the most joy, like as like an activity, like I like thinking. And I know that that's just not something everyone has the luxury of doing. At the same time, it is a very time consuming lifestyle choice. One of the quotes, the department head who hired me in, and I think she, what she said summarizes a lot of times. She said, you can choose to work any 60 hours a week you want. And I think like it's flexible in some ways, but it's also very time consuming. I don't know if it's always 60, but I do think that like doing this job has required, it's impacted like my lifestyle choice. So like where I live has been influenced by it. Who I socialize with has been influenced by it. Like how I engage with the public, how I interpret or consume media, like my decision to be a professor, I think changed my whole life in a way that I don't necessarily think I fully understood. Like I think certain lifestyles don't necessarily just align as easily with this lifestyle that we choose once you're like stuck in the academy for a little while. 
And I do think it's important for you to ask people what they're like, like what a day looks like when they take breaks and to get an understanding of like what life looks like, not just the work, but like actually how they're living their life and how that is tied or not tied or bounded by the job choice you're making. Because I think that is something that is hard to know until you're in it. And I don't think we just automatically talk about it because it's easy to just focus on the work. But I do think it has a lot of implications on like broader decisions you're going to about what, what else you want to do with your life and what things work well and what things don't work well. And like I said, it's your choice. So you do kind of have to be mindful of that. Um, it's also let me choose my collaborators. I have a very small group of people that I decide to work with. And I have grown to appreciate the fact that I've, if it does not work well, I can stop working with people. And I realized that if I was working somewhere else, I wouldn't necessarily have that choice. So I have a group of people that I would call like my Mount Rushmore. Like I have like four or five people that I'm like, I could work with these people on everything and be fine because our interests align, our work styles align, our work ethics align, like, and it's real good. I also get to choose the students I work with, which is also very helpful. I don't get to choose the students I teach, but I do have a lot of control over the students that I fund, the students that I advise, and that's been pretty, again, like I don't take for granted that I get to work with very wonderful people. And I think it makes my job much better than I think a lot of people's job. And I think that's something that has come specifically because of the fact that I've chosen to be a professor. And I've been able to decide who I want to submit grants with, which students I want to recruit, who I want to fund, which types of topics I want to recruit students for. And like I said, it's something that I would not take for granted that I think does not come in certain careers. Number eight, it has come with a lot of opportunities to travel. So as I mentioned, I spent my entire childhood and young adulthood in South Carolina. I had never been on a plane before I came to Virginia Tech. And since then I have actually had a lot of opportunities to go to different places. So I've gone to Australia, I've gone to Spain, I've gone to Morocco, I've gone to a lot of cities around the United States, primarily just because of the way academic conferences work, the way study abroad opportunities kind of pop up. And it's been like just an interesting space that I'm like, okay, while I do, I am restricted in where I live, there are ample opportunities for me to collaborate with people and take advantage of opportunities that will let me see other parts of the world in ways that I have grown to appreciate that. I'm like, the ability to travel for work has been pretty nice, especially if, if you like traveling, but don't want to always pay for stuff yourself. I think being in the academy is an interesting way of kind of having a dynamic life, even though there are some constraints. And then the last one, which I kind of knew, I think understanding the implications of it is tricky sometimes, is I am like married to the academic calendar, which I think there are pros and cons. On a pro, we have a lot of breaks. So like when Thanksgiving comes, I can get a break. When winter comes, I can get a break. Over the summer, because I'm a nine month employee, I can take breaks. On the flip side, if I want to take a break that is not aligned with a university break, it can be trickier because it's not like the work just pauses. Like the rhythm of the university kind of does control the way I live my life. And that's one of the reasons I also said it's a lifestyle choice is the type, like the, the way work flows. And I'd imagine in any industry, there are busier times and less busy times and like how long you can take breaks and stuff that you have to keep in mind. But I have realized that like I am attached to the academic calendar in ways that my peers are not. Like they can be like, I'm taking a two week vacation and it could be like, they don't necessarily need to think about what month it is. Whereas for me, if I'm trying to take a break, I necessarily like, okay, if I take it in August, is it before the semester or after the semester? Am I gonna wait? Like, what are the implications of this? When do I teach? Like, I think I have to think about my time in a way that is not typical to a lot of professions because we work in this way that is very cyclical. And it's just something that I don't know, I still don't know if I think this is a pro or a con. I think, I've, I think it has had some benefits, but I think it has also had some downsides. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. So I think there are some highlights and lowlights. And the last point I wanna make, so there's a parable about the monk and the minister from this book called The Simple Path to Wealth. I have recently really started thinking about like financial independence, creating the life that I want, thinking about how finances interact with that. 
and this story kind of stuck out with me that was in the beginning of the book that I think relates to the like key takeaway that I would want you to have from this conversation. So I said, two close boyhood friends grow up and go their separate ways. One becomes a humble monk, the other a rich and powerful minister to the king. Years later, they meet. As they catch up, the minister in his fine robes takes pity on the thin shabby monk. Seeking to help, he says, you know, if you could learn to cater to the king, you wouldn't have to live on rice and beans. To which the monk replies, if you could learn to live on rice and beans, you wouldn't have to cater to the king. And the reason I wanted to share this is, regardless of whether you have complete control, you can make a lot of decisions that turn, that will influence how you live your life. And if you're intentional, you can get the life you want, but it is like, you have to be very aware of like what you're giving up, what the implications of those decisions are gonna be and not necessarily get caught up in what everybody else around you is doing. And I think that that's what this really drives home is there are times when we see, oh, well, I have these nice things, or these must be pros when like your lifestyle, if you made a subtle different decision could like free you up in a way that you didn't necessarily think about. And I think right now, because you are getting advanced degrees and thinking about your path, I think it's the perfect time for you to think about like, what would a good life look like? How will these decisions facilitate that? How will they enable it? How will they constrain it? And don't necessarily let the credential itself like drive it. Like, don't let the prestige of a tenure track position drive your decisions. Don't let the prestige of universities drive your decisions. Like, really think about, like, what do I want my life to look like? And will this decision get me closer to that or further than that? And I think it'll help you make a lot of decisions, at least in more creative ways. Like, I think there are, I think we have a lot more agency than we realize sometimes. And I think there are a lot of people who are counting on you to not realize you have that agency. But like, that's kind of where I'm at right now is figuring out like, what does life, what do I want life to look like and how do I kind of best get there? And those are some of the highlights from the career path I've chosen that I think hopefully will help you make some decisions about like which path actually makes the most sense based on what's important in your life. So that is all I have prepared and I'm hoping you'll have some questions. Let me see. So I have the first question. So it says, as an international student, could you share your insights of how you might increase my chances to enter US faculty position pathways? In other words, what would be the most aspects to focus on in my PhD years here in the US before searching? So one thing I would ask, like I think my general philosophy on advice is if anyone ever gives you advice without asking you questions first, it's probably bad advice. Cause I'm like, I can't give you advice if without knowing some more stuff. My, First thought would be, do you care where you live in the United States? Because I think some places are just a lot harder to get jobs than others. What type of faculty positions are you willing to take and not willing to take to kind of narrow down some of the constraints? And then also thinking about whether you're open to doing postdocs or not, because I think sometimes those can increase your chances in positions, like how long you're willing to work towards the position. Like, I think there's a lot of, factors that I think would have to know to know kind of what advice, but I think I would start by saying, understanding like what you're willing to give up, how hard you're willing to work and kind of like what that's gonna look like. I was actually listening to a podcast today and one of the points he made, he was like the two things that you actually do control, it was like discipline and kind of like your attitude. It's like, you can't control a whole lot of stuff, but you can control kind of like how disciplined or committed you're going to stay to a path and you can also control like how you're going to kind of view it mentally along the way and like that would be like my initial reactions and I think talking to a lot of faculty who you know were international students to understand if they did something that is different because like right now I have assumptions about like what path people take but I'm also not aware of some of the additional hurdles that might come with being an international student but I do think talking to people in both might help shed some light on what might be unique given your circumstances? Are there other questions? I see one just popped in, Walter. Hmm, that is a very interesting question. What do I think you get from a PhD that you do not get from a master's degree? 
I think the biggest probably benefit from going through the PhD, like going through the entire research process is, and I think it depends on like how you did your master thesis. But if I make the, if I make an assumption that it's slightly smaller, I think the skill of being able to form a question, convince people that the question that you formed is important and convince them that you, the approach you have come up with to answer the question like I think the practice that you have to do to kind of earn a PhD in that area specifically, I think that is harder to get in a lot of other skills, whether it was a master's degree or whether it was a thesis. I think that is something that like the amount of time, I don't think you have, I don't think there's any other time in your life where you have as much space and time to think about one topic as earning a PhD. So like a master's degree moves pretty quickly, even as a faculty member, I don't have the amount of time I had to think about like one space. So like, I think like that skill of being able to take a very deep dive, being able to like teach yourself, because I do think that by the time you get the PhD, you can probably teach yourself most stuff if you really wanted to. And I would say like that skill, like the ability to answer questions that people care about and kind of talk about how all the pieces fit together and being able to communicate what that knowledge means. I would say like that is a very strong transferable skill that is helpful to a lot of people in ways that we don't necessarily always think about. Um, when it comes to autopilot through credential, has this reflection on lows and highs as well as their implementation on your life helped to be more intentional in the forward thought of your future goals? It has. So like right now, all right now I'm at a space when I think I'm going to have to make a decision about like, do I want to go the administrative route? Or do I want to stay on the research route? Do I want to start other things on the side? And I am at the point now when I, I am very aware of the implications of being an administrator as it relates to time. And I have not decided if that is how I want to use my time or not. Because like right now, while I might make less money not being an administrator, I might have less control over certain stuff. What I do have control over that administrators do not always have is I have control over my calendar. And I think at a certain point, you have to make that decision of the time versus money thing is like, how much time are you willing to trade for money? And how much flexibility are you willing to give up? And I think right now, because I have been fully aware of the fact that like some of the decisions have constrained me, I am aware of the fact that there are also some other decisions that someone's going to put on the table that if I did say yes to would similarly constrain me and they might further constrain me. And I think I'd have to decide like how much flexibility and control over my actual day-to-day -day experience I want. And I think that that is something to really keep in mind when it comes to saying yes to certain opportunities. Because in general, like when they're paying you more, they're paying you more for a reason. And I think just can't let the money drive the decision. So like, I think that's kind of where I'm at the most right now. I've also, like in my personal life, like thinking about like how much control over do I want where I live? Like, I think you have to make decisions when you're a faculty member, like, do you want to live in one place forever? Do you want to take positions that kind of tie you in one place? Do you want to have more flexibility? Do you want to live in two places? Like, I think right now I'm at a point when I'm trying to figure out what I want life to look like. I also recently got married. So like figuring out what I want both of our lives to look like and thinking about that has been interesting. But like, that's kind of where I'm at right now is figuring out kind of like, I think the balance between time and money and like where, like how high I want to go in my career and at what cost, I think that's where I'm at right now. And I don't know if I figured out a good answer yet, but I do know which questions to ask if people bring me opportunities. Like I have, I do realize that like how much flexibility I have is a very important factor in the decisions I'm making. Do you have any advice on how to make the PhD process a little less all-consuming? I actually don't know if I have a good answer here, which is why I think that it is really important to realize that it is going to be all-encompassing because I think sometimes we get in it and we're like, I have to think about this thing so much and like I have to read about it and write about it and talk about it and get feedback about it and like, it just becomes such a central part to what you're doing that I think if you don't realize that, I think it can be tricky. And I think that it's hard. I think that 
I don't know if I have a good answer. I don't know if I have done a good job of making it not all consuming. I think I have just recently realized that I'm like, this thing is, it influences how I touch everything I touch. And it's just something that I think I'm still grappling with right now. I have to think about that. That's a good question. I don't know if, if Dr. Waller has <laughs> figured out the, the secret to that one, but I'm like, that is a, I think that is a million dollar question. It is. Uh, I think one of the things that you have to think about is work-life balance. Is it really there? Is there a balance? No. Uh, you have to figure out what works for you and not everything that I consume is the same as you. Uh, so, but having people in your life to hold you accountable, uh, it's very important when you're looking at work-life balance uh, because it can consume you, uh, especially the PhD process. Mm -hmm. um, and are you taking healthy measures to do those checks? Uh, because I know when I was doing the PhD, I had to go to counseling. Uh, part of the process is, okay, we wanna remain healthy. Uh, and it's a process. Uh, and you have to think about it in chunks, not all consuming per se, but how do you manage it versus it managing you? Uh, so I don't have a, a right answer, but I say accountability, uh, having folks in your life that will give you the support that uh, will help guide you. Uh, and it's okay to make a decision. Um, you can change it. Uh, so. Uh, it's a growth process, but remain positive in that growth mindset. It's interesting that you said that because I do have an answer now that after I've listened to you, you <laughs> part of my thought. So one of the things, like there's two ways that I've seen people talk about work-life balance in ways that I think are helpful when you find yourself in this position where it is going to be consuming. So one of my good friends is a CEO of a startup and he was like, there is no work-life balance. He's like, the way he views it is like, it's more like work-life prioritization. He's like, when I am working, I am working. When I am not working, I have to be fully present and not working. And he's like, sometimes there's more work than life, but he's just a very firm believer in those two things, not clouding each other so much that you can't focus on what the thing is supposed to be. And I could often say like, keep the main thing, the main thing. And I think that that is helpful sometimes so that when you do step away, like if you're on a break, you have to make the break the break. It might not be balanced to the point that you're like, I'm spending as much time as I would like doing it. But you might have to just say like, how can I block out the PhD when I need to and actually stay true to the other stuff that I'm trying to work on? And then the other way, one of my PhD students who was studying um, the careers of women in tech would talk about like the, I don't know if it was like the alignment between work and life, but like thinking about if it is gonna be all encompassing, how do you make sure that the life you're living is not a life you don't want to live? Because mm -hmm. it is like, sometimes you do end up in a career when it's like, this is a lot of a big part of my life. And I think to Dr. Wallace's point, like you do have to figure out like, how do I take control of it? Like, how can I shape this? And like, am I comfortable with the way things are going right now? But those are like the, the next things that came through that remind me of how I, how I've seen people live who I know are very, very, very busy. And I think some of it is them just, realizing that like yeah i'm going to be busy right now like that is the truth but like when i'm with my family i am with my family like mm -hmm. i need to be fully present or when i'm taking a break it needs to actually be a break and i think i'm i think i have gotten better at that but i do think that like that is also very important and like seeking help like i think if you are at a space when you're like i can't i'm having a hard time doing that separation then i think whether you seek professional help or talking to people is helpful Do I ever feel tightly defined by my credentials and I would like to be? How do you separate yourself? I've given a lot of thought about how I brand myself as a scholar and academic. And I don't usually feel tightly defined by my credential because one, most people don't know what it means. So like I have the luxury of when people see engineering education, they don't usually have a lot of assumptions or prior experience to know exactly what that means which in some ways means I have to show up in the room and kind of do some clarification. But on the pro side, that also means that I get to do the clarifying. 
I also find that sometimes people just see PhD and they don't know what it's in. So like how you leverage your credential, what part you lead with, sometimes people just know like, oh, they know you do something, but they don't necessarily know exactly what that means. So I think outside of academia, I think that I have felt pretty free, I think. Um, I don't know if I would ever say like, I have felt like too tightly defined, but I do think right now, like I have been trying to figure out like how I want to brand myself. So like right now I've, I'm interested in consulting and I've been trying to figure out like, how do I want to position that? Like, what do I want to call it? How do I want to frame it? Do I only want to work with people in engineering or do I want to work with people outside? And I think I have felt like I have more freedom because of my credentials than I realized, not necessarily like tightly defined by them. Primarily because I think once you get in certain spaces, people don't, people don't care that you're an academic sometimes. And sometimes they don't know unless you tell them. So I think that you can figure out how you show up. You can figure out when you lead with it, when you don't lead with it. I just think you do have to be intentional about how you like, even something as simple as if you're a faculty member and you're trying to figure out like what to name your group. Like all of those have decisions for how people view the work you're doing. How you think about how you explain your research. Like all of those, I do think, I think they can tightly define you. But I think if you're intentional, you don't necessarily have to make them tightly define you. Like if you're, if you're very careful with how you talk about stuff and think about it much more from like a marketing perspective. So I have tried to view myself as like much more like a little company within a company. So one of the, a lot of times people will compare faculty to like entrepreneurs, but we have the benefit of like, there's an umbrella organization that keeps the lights on that makes sure my checks come. But at the same time, I can decide how do I want to talk about my work? What I want to train my graduate students to do, how I want to talk about what we do, whether I want to create my own website or not. Like there's a whole lot of flexibility in there if you're willing to like take advantage of it. But that also then requires more work. So then you're also trying to figure out that balance of like how much time are you willing to put forth to this? Is the academy your end game? Or is this like a stepping stone you get in somewhere else? Like all of those can kind of influence how you play the game. What would I do differently if I had not focused on the credentials? Hmm. I probably would have taken more advantage of, I think, like my financial situation and what I was using with my talent earlier. Like right now, like I'm in, when I see grad students who are like, oh, I'm already an expert to some people. Like I have a master's or they're like, I already have a bunch of experience. Like I have a degree. I know a bunch of stuff. And like, I'll see some people start building a brand because they know they want to go in that direction later. So they're like, well, I might as well start building an audience and let people know I'm doing that now. Or like there's even some decisions where like I was just kind of just letting loans go behind me. I didn't think about any ways of making my money stretch further. I didn't think about ways of generating additional income. I honestly didn't learn anything about how any of this stuff worked until I got a job. And I was like, oh, I have to make like some decisions. Like I don't know any of this. Like, do I wanna work till I'm 60? I don't wanna work till I'm 60. I might've made different decisions <laughs> about a lot of this if I would've been like, oh, which path's gonna make it so I don't have to work quicker. Like, I think those are some of the decisions I might've made slightly different. I might've done a thesis for my master's. I might've thought about strengthening my industrial systems engineering technical knowledge. If I would've thought about the fact that I might've wanted to consult later. Those are some of the immediate things that come to mind is, I think I might've just been a little bit more intentional about how I leverage the skills I got, which skills I picked up and understanding the influences of the decisions I made on like how long I would have to work. Because I think the more I've learned about like personal finance, the more I've realized like, oh, like a little decision can make it. So you have to work five more years. And like just some, I think a little bit more strategic decisions and uses of my money earlier might've changed some stuff and I probably would have made slightly different decisions. I don't know if I'd have made any drastically different decisions. I think I am generally very happy with where I am at right now. But I think some of that has been, I just so happened to make decisions that happened to work out. Like, I don't know if I was as intentional. I think I just happened to be like, oh, that, in hindsight, that was a good decision. Probably a better decision than I realized at the time. But I think sometimes that can work in your benefit. Sometimes it doesn't. Are there any other questions out there? Well, Walter, I believe you've done an excellent job 
in talking about more than a credential, uh, you got me thinking and what I need to do. Um, so I, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for your presentation. We look forward to having you in the future. Uh, again, um, if everyone could say thank you to Walter, uh, we appreciate it a lot and we'll end the session for today. Thank you for the invitation. If anybody